Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is category theory. Today, one of the most important topics in category theory, and maybe in mathematics, and maybe in life. Oh, I'm, I'm overstressing a little bit. But anyway, one of the most important concepts, uh, duality. So what is duality in category theory? It will be flipping errors, as we will see. But it's kind of this idea uh, that every statement has a dual statement, like a coin, and that you have a different side of the coin. Um, and kind of whatever you say about the statement is true for the dual statement, and whatever you say about the dual statement is true for the statement. So there are always two sides of the same coin, right? So kind of this idea is that there is a Zemo two action somewhere um, in life, whatever. So kind of life prefers Zemo two actions if you think about it a little bit. But anyway, and kind of on opposite corners, you kind of have two very different looking concepts, maybe, but actually they're the same up to reinterpretation. Of what you see. Um, and this is just a very important concept that we will kind of see today a little bit in action. So um, I would like to start with a familiar example. Usually I would start with sets um, instead of vector spaces as here, but this is a little bit easier to see in vector spaces. So let's start with vector spaces. Actually, strictly speaking, I'm starting with FD vector spaces, so finite dimensional vector spaces, because I want to take a kind of dual vector space at one point. Um, it doesn't really matter so much. You can ignore that if you want. So how do we would like to think about vector spaces, a category of vector spaces? Well, there's a field involved. If you don't like K as a notation, you can use R or whatever your favorite field is. Q is definitely my favorite field or whatever you like. And, and the objects are well, vector spaces. So kind of, kind of it's a four, for example, K to the four or K squared, something like that. And the, the arrows, right? So the, the maps here are matrices. So here's a four by two matrix, which I hope is uh, the correct way of writing it. As always, again, a Z mod two action in life. Um, there are two ways of writing down the matrix, and you actually see that here. So it is a two by four matrix. Um, it's kind of a dual concept here. And duality, what is duality doing? Duality takes a dual vector space. And if you think a little bit of, about what the dual vector space is, kind of this definition of whether, or this, this choice of whether you write this one here, whether you write a vector as a column, or you write a vector as a row. Uh, one of them is a vector, if you want. One of them is a linear form, if you want. Uh, that's kind of the convention here. And they are, of course, dual to one another. There's an obvious procedure going from one to the other. But they kind of still play slightly different roles. And you could do the same in more generality. You could just go to this dual vector space. You could dualize the matrix, which is really just transposing the matrix. So all I did here is I just transpose the matrix to go from here to here. So in uh, my dual vector spaces, which I denote by up here, I will explain that in a second, it's opposite, um, you'll see that, um, everything is kind of reversed. So you transpose the matrix, uh, you keep the object as they are, because um, in this case, a vector space is isomorphic to its dual. That's why I'm using that as finite dimensional. But anyway, but as you can see, the matrix is transposed. So actually the order of composition of the matrix reverses. And now the arrow, which went in this direction here and now goes in this direction, right? So you um, flip the arrows. Uh, so that's what I call flip here. So you fix the vertices, uh, sorry, the, the objects because finite dimensional vector space is self dual, but you flip the vertices because you need to transpose matrices. And the transposition really comes from this interpretation of uh, a vector either as a row or a column is really where it comes from. Whether you want to interpret it as a, as a column vector, which is kind of a vector in the classical sense, or a row vector, which is more like a linear form um, in the classical sense, whatever. But you can do the same in any type of category. So my favorite category, of course, uh, one cop, where the objects are just natural numbers, so three and five, for example, and the morphisms would be something like that I've drawn here above, some diagram that you can connect three and five. So from three at the bottom, to five at the top, and composition is stacking those diagrams together. And yeah, so this is a diagram in one cop. This is a morphism in one cop, an arrow. Um, and it, there's still a duality, and it's completely different from the one on vector spaces. It's kind of the point here again. In category theory, everything is so generalized, or everything is nicely generalized, that very different looking things fit into the same story. So here, my duality is not transposing matrices or whatever, because I don't even have a matrix. No, it's just flipping the map. So I have some axis somewhere here, and I just flip it along the axis, and I get this diagram. And of course, as before, 
flipping a diagram along an axis now or whatever if five was at the top and three was at the bottom but of course now five is at the bottom and three is at the top by construction right because i flipped the diagram so actually the arrow is again reversed so it goes from here to here and it goes from here to here on the other side so uh, duality here looks very different than in vector spaces but it still does the same thing it kind of fixes the the, the um, object so there's no difference for the object and uh, i don't even know what it means to vertically mirror or, or horizontally mirror or whatever you call that um, and, and n <laughs> so it doesn't matter it's just fixed but um, the mirror on the diagrams is just a flip map and it flips the arrows around right it's kind of really the same right it's kind of a point very differently looking kind of still very similar in nature that's the whole point of gallery theory right so set, uh, sets basically here or vector spaces which was a little bit easier for me to illustrate um, transposing matrices is duality or taking dual vector spaces if you like it more formally and here duality is just very very different but kind of still satisfies the same properties and then the point is this funny picture that i stole from the nice book uh, the joy of cats just linked in the description that every statement has a dual statement or some people call it the core statement so there will be a lot of things that are whatever. There will be an equalizer, and then there will be a co-equalizer. It's kind of the same thing, just they turned everything around, just flipped everything. There's a ring, and then there's a co-ring, where everything is turned around. And sometimes it's easier to think about a certain type of object than about the other. And sometimes it's easier to think about the other than about certain type of objects. My favorite example is the one of a ring. Um, so kind of every student in mathematics knows what a ring is. We are exposed to a ring very, very early on. Kind of very biased. Um, so our brain kind of likes rings. Um, a core ring is exactly the same thing, just dual. Uh, but it's kind of very hard to wrap your head around a core ring, at least it is for me. Um, but there's luckily this, this duality, which I'm going to explain on the next slide, which says kind of everything I say about rings is true about core rings anyway. So I don't need to worry too much. Anyway, this is how it works. Uh, so I have a statement here, the, the red one, and I have a dual statement, the bottom one, and I have an intermediate statement here. So let's read the statement. I just took a random statement, basically. Uh, so for all y in C, there exists a, a, an arrow, a unique arrow f from x to y right? in C. That's my statement. I could interpret that in the category op, which I'm going to explain. Um, and it's just exactly the same. Just there's an intermediate category, which I call op. And there will be, uh, so the difference here is here's C, here's C op, here's C, here's C op. And the dual statement is kind of this funny thing for all y and c, there exists still an f, but look at the arrow. The arrow is turned around. I'll give you more examples in a second. And this is kind of the point. You have a statement and you have a dual statement. You have, you have p and you have p op. p op here is the kind of notation for the dual statement. Um, so you have p and you have p op. And you can do that for any type of statement you want. And now it comes to the point. So what is this op? It's called the opposite category. That's where the name comes from. So in general, it's not quite a dual category. Kind of you could think of uh, whenever you have a duality, it's kind of a little bit of a nicer setup. And the opposite just works in general. And it works as follows. It's a new category that you cook up from C. And it always exists. It's very, very easy to see that it always exists. Um, it has the same object, kind of reconstructed. That's how you see that it exists. Um, it has an opposite morphism. So if I have an F from X to Y, I will have an opposite morphism, an F op. Some people just would draw the removes the op and just would just say it's and I would do that as well. Uh, it's just uh, the, the reverse arrow. But strictly speaking, it's kind of the opposite. You just give it an extra symbol kind of an opposite morphism um, for each already existing morphisms. And the composition, well, let's have a look at the composition. What is the composition saying? The composition says that the composition of the ops as the kind of the flip of the compositions of um, the original one. So let's see whether that makes sense. So if you have a matrix A and you have a matrix B and you transpose them, that was the operation on vector spaces, then this is actually A transpose, B transpose, in, in case you remember your linear algebra. Otherwise, you don't you just easily check it on your favorite matrix A and B. Um, so yeah, this operation is really just motivated by transposing matrices. And in this picture, it's exactly the same because now everything is reversed. So the order of composition is also reversed. So here taking the opposite, uh, so in, the, in one cop taking the opposite was flipping. And again, the order of composition is reversed. Okay, um, that was a lot of raffle. Let me just say it again. So objects in the opposite category are the same. Morphisms are kind of the same. We just give them a different symbol and remember that they point in opposite directions. And the composition is 
reversed, like the, the opposite um, of opposition. And the duality principle, kind of the main important principle of category theory, if you want, uh, in some sense, there are a lot of very important concepts of category theory. I shouldn't say that, but this one is pretty cool. So a property holds for all categories, if and only if the opposite property holds for all categories. And that's kind of nice. Um, so you only, only ever have to check which one you like, right? There's a statement for rings and for co-rings, for opposite rings, whatever, co they mean you call it co-rings, whatever. And um, in, in certain types, and usually if you prove it for rings, then you can prove it for core rings. And if you prove it for core rings, then you can prove it for rings. It's kind of the idea. And there's this funny self duality, and that's kind of how it boils down to. So C op op is C. So if you do the opposite construct twice, it's actually the same as C. Um, strictly speaking, that's not quite true because my, just a technical issue here. Uh, I would be, it would be isomorphic to C because um, in C op, uh, op op, my morphisms would have two labels. It would be F op op, um, but kind of the, the ops, forget it. It's the same category. I'm just waffling. Um, and some statements and categories actually can be self dual. So my examples here were self dual, which is not true in general. Just be careful. And statements can be self dual. For example, being an identity arrow is a self dual statement. Uh, again, in general, this is not true. So this, for example, was not self dual state. Okay, let's have a look at a more familiar one, maybe. Again, it's all is a generalization of something you all know, right? So let's have a look at sets, a dual concept in sets. So here, this is an injection, um, and this is a surjection. Um, I illustrated, right? An injection, you know what an injection is. And you also know what a surjection is. And the statement could be, for example, now um, a statement which would happen in set, uh, something like this, the green one, and I will show you the, the opposite statement, the red one, in a second. So it could be for all G um, with, uh, sorry, for all F there exists G such that this holds. So I have X here, this is F, and I have this map G such that here is the identity. Okay, very good. Um, right, that's a property for F. This, uh, this was kind of uh, a property for object X, but it could be a property for a morphism or an arrow or a collection of objects, collection of morphisms or everything mixed, basically what you want. Anyway, so this is a property on X, uh, on F. So uh, property is satisfied if there exists G, uh, such that you have this diagram. Okay, very nice. And the opposite property is exactly the opposite. So now, uh, G goes first, comes first, and then comes Y. And if you think about this, what this means in terms of sets, then it's the following. So A holds in set if and only if F is injective up to a certain nonsense that have. So injective and subjective are not quite dual concepts as I'm going to explain, but ignore that for a second. So um, A holds in set if and only if F is injective, and B holds in set the dual statement if and only if F is surjective. So kind of these are dual concepts. Not quite, there's a slight catch that, um, as you can already see it here. So what you would do is you kind of would reverse all arrows and if you reverse all arrows in the surjection, you should get an injection. Uh, the problem is you kind of have an ambiguity here what to do with those two arrows. So it's not quite perfect. And here, if you would reverse all arrows, uh, you have an ambiguity here because you kind of need to fill in potentially some arrows. So they're not quite a dual statement, but they're dual in, the, in this sense. So the statement A holds if and only if F is injective, and statement B holds if and only if F is surjective. And this is usually how those dual statements look like. And if you check one of them, you kind of have to already check the other. Okay, let me wrap up. Duality, extremely important concept in mathematics and in particular in category theory. It's kind of this idea that everything has a dual, as a coin with two sides, everything is a dual, whatever you say about the dual is true about the original question, whatever you say about your original question is true about the dual. And it can come in various different incarnations, you could transpose matrices, you could flip diagrams, but in the end it's a kind of flipping of arrow process in category theory language. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.